Hello everyone and welcome to Banner Broadcasting. I am Jarl Trigvi. This will be the first of hopefully many videos to come for me and my associates here on this channel. Our plan is to create videos about the games we play and enjoy. Today will be a pilot episode of sorts. Without further ado, here's today's video. I have been a longtime fan of the Destiny series of games. I started playing soon after launch. A friend of mine suggested I get it and play with our buddies. Since then, I have kept up with the series. Like the rest of the player base, I saw the ups and downs in the game since 2014. I made friends, joined clans, went on raids, slew gods, and had a good time. Recently, with Season of Dawn ramping up to its conclusion, and the rest of Destiny 2 Year 3 getting ready to begin, it seemed like a good time to put in my two cents on Shadowkeep, Season of the Undying, and Season of Dawn. I will start by saying, Shadowkeep is a solid expansion to the Destiny universe. It is no Taken King, but it is significantly better than the Curse of Osiris and Warmind DLCs. It has several strong points and a few faults worth mentioning. I will say here, spoilers ahead, but this DLC has been out since October of last year, so the spoiler grace period is far over at this time. Narratively, it seamlessly fits into the established mythos of the universe without clashing with ideas of characters or previously established lore, like the Curse of Osiris and Warmind. When I heard Eris Morn was going to return, I was afraid they were going to change her character or retcon parts of her story. While this did happen, it happened in a way that did not come off as lazy like the retcons from Warmind did in particular. Eris was given more depth as a character in this story than she has had since the Dark Below back in Destiny 1. The introduction of the darkness in the pyramid ships was something most of us were expecting in Destiny 3. This and the hive changing on Luna set up a solid foundation for the story to take place on. The lunar armor and weapons were interesting and functional. All the weapons are unique and use their own models compared to previous armaments with the exception of the Altar of Sorrow weapons. The Nightmares make a good sort of foil for the Guardians, narratively speaking. From a gameplay perspective, their fights are unique and interesting, at least the first few times through them. The Garden of Salvation raid was a solid addition to the growing list of raids in the game. I did the raid with my clan and got the Divinity, so I've had my fill of the experience. It's not bad. The encounters were easy to learn mechanically, and the bosses did not feel gimmicky or overly complicated like some of the previous raids. Narratively, it ties the events of the Hive and Darkness-themed story to the Vex of the Black Garden and the Season of the Undying. Now for the shortcomings of this DLC. The story did not make sense all the way through. It begins with a vanguard assault on the Hive's new Scarlet Keep on Luna. The problem with this is after the fight, there is minimal vanguard presence at all on Luna. Commander Zavala is there at the start, giving orders as an army of guardians and frames attack the hive. As the story progresses, the player becomes an agent of Eris. The player does what she needs them to do in order to gain access to the pyramid ship below the lunar surface. Ikora shows up to see what's going on with Eris and the guardian and to give them resources. After that, it's just Eris, the guardian, and a few frames on Luna. What happened to the war with the Hive? The Altars of Sorrow and the Scarlet Keep are still intact. The Hive only maybe lost one leader in the form of Hashladun, the daughter of Crota, but she is Ascendant and therefore not actually dead. The story is saying a huge army of nearly immortal demigods just gave up with the war they were actively winning, and it's just never brought up again. They just give up. When the Guardian enters the pyramid ship is the biggest fault of the story. The mission itself is good, but it ends too abruptly. The ghost is possessed by the darkness, and the guardian is deep within the pyramid ship, talking with a dark mirror version of himself or herself. Then the DLC is just over. No explanation for how the player gets out or gets their ghost back. It's a solid foundation of a story with nothing built onto it to finish. We just have the hive plot that was gone without resolution, and now we have the darkness itself speaking to the player after baiting them inside. It seemed like it needed another few story missions to resolve these problems. Instead, we cut to black and there's an unexplained teleport back to Sanctuary with Eris. Then comes the Garden of Salvation raid and the tie-in to the Season of the Undying. Narratively, it seems like the darkness baited us into kicking a metaphorical hornet's nest to cause a fight between the Vex and the Guardians on Luna. 
to get them to leave the pyramid ship alone. That is my best guess to figure out how these three stories tie together. The game saw two new strikes added to the playlist, technically three if you're not a PS4 user. Of all the things in this game that need some love, that playlist is up there, near the top. It has gotten the short end of the stick for content in every Destiny 2 DLC, with the exception of Forsaken. The changes made to content in Destiny 2 over the course of Year 2 were mostly beneficial. Smaller, more consistent DLC drops and events kept the community playing. I was pleased to hear this model was going to be used in Year 3. Plus, it was going to be an overarching narrative tying each season to the next. It seemed great that Shadowkeep would launch with one of those seasons quickly in tow. There were other announcements I found to be at first disappointing, but I came to accept as Season of the Undying unfolded. The positives for this season are easy. The new exotic weapons all felt unique and each found their place in my arsenal, except for the Xenophage. It was not working properly during this season. The Leviathan's Breath is a fun weapon. I use it for demoralizing invaders and Gambit. Ariana's Vow feels like the Destiny equivalent to a Desert Eagle especially when it's masterworked. I use it for Nightfalls and the Vex Offensive, because it has a very strong shield-breaking potential. Deathbringer is not one I use often. It's in the game. It feels more like a void version of the Dragon's Breath from Destiny 1 and doesn't bring much actually new to the table. Looks cool, though. The seasonal armor sets a good look, and their ornaments make them look spectacular. The new shielded and unstoppable champions and harder difficulty modes are a fresh mechanic for them. The addition of the season pass, like a lot of other games have nowadays, did not sit right with me at first. I warmed up to the idea as the season went on because I felt like I was being rewarded for spending time in game. All of the rewards were not great, but it got the job done. The retirement of pinnacle weapons and the birth of their replacement ritual weapons felt like a lessening of the experience overall. As I grinded for them, it felt like another thing to do for a collection requirement on a title, rather than hunting down a new good weapon. The weapons themselves are fairly good and sit in the upper mid-tier in my eyes when it comes to legendary weapons in Destiny. The best of them this season by far is Randy's throwing knife from the Crucible followed by the exit strategy from Gambit, and finally the Edgewise from the Strike playlist. Each of them attempts to fill a unique niche in the gun meta of this game. The only one that fails at this is the Edgewise. It feels like a lesser version of the 21% Delirium introduced in the Season of the Drifter. The problems with the Season of the Undying all lie in the new Vex-themed activities Bungie has put as the focus for the season. The invasions on Luna with the Gate Lords and the giant Hydra boss were fun when instances had players in them to do it. The Vex Offensive is just repetitive, uninspired, and only worked as a way to grind seasonal pass XP and other requirements for the Season of the Undying title. That's it. Narratively, it was about stopping an old enemy from Destiny 1, the Undying Mind. The Undying Mind is trying to revive the Heart of Darkness in the Black Garden from Destiny 1. Why it did not just revive the Black Heart in all the years since we've been in the Black Garden, I don't know. The season built towards this confrontation between Guardians and this Vex Mind that is copying itself into other timelines to not be destroyed. We had to fight the Vex and wait for the portal Ikora and the Vanguard were making to be completed before we could even challenge the Undying Mind. Then the day came for this boss fight. What crazy twist was coming? How would the setup for the Season of Dawn? Well, what came was a reskin of a Menagerie boss from the Season of Opulence, and no real changes came to the Vex Offensive or the surrounding world. It did not seem to tie into the Season of Dawn either so far. Season of Dawn is not over yet, but I doubt the story beat will be mentioned again over the course of this season. The Season of Dawn is far superior to the Season of the Undying, narratively speaking. The story was slow and unsatisfying in the Season of the Undying, but Season of Dawn worked a much better season-long story into the game. It begins with Osiris summoning the player to Mercury to help him deal with some leftover Red Legion Cabal that have messed up time by hijacking Osiris's time machine called the Sundial to access the Vex time network. 
We find out that he built it to try to save his old friend, the legendary Titan, Saint-14, from his untimely death inside the Infinite Forest. We go on to use the Sundial ourselves to fight the Cabal, and an additional quest to find Saint-14 in the Corridors of Time opens up. New loot becomes available as the obelisks are upgraded, and as you do quests for Saint-14. As the season went on, more story pieces became available. First, the Corridors of Time puzzle. That hyped the community up and got people working to solve it. The end result split the community, though. A lot of people had high expectations for the activity. The rewards for the activity were a full new lore book, an exclusive emblem, and an early start for an exotic quest. A very vocal part of the community felt that this was an unfair reward. They were up in arms about not receiving something that was never promised. They wanted an old exotic back or a new secret weapon of some sort that they were never promised. As to what was expected, it seems to vary from person to person, but apparently early access to one of the best non-broken fusion rifles in the game wasn't enough for some people. Then we get to the event happening now, the Empyrean Restoration Effort, and the new boss in the Sundial. As of writing this, the Empyrean Restoration Effort has reached its third step of the seven total. I am among the camp that believes the conclusion of this effort will be the announcement of the return of the Trials of Osiris next season. Now on to other reviews for this season. Ritual weapons have grown on me more since they were introduced in October. Randy's throwing knife has become a regular in my arsenal, especially with scout rifles having the barrier piercing mod this season. The weapons this season are decent. Starting with the worst comes the Komodo FR4. It is a linear fusion rifle with the perks no distractions and box breathing. It's a solid combo, but even with the buffs Bungie keeps giving them, linear fusion rifles just feel outclassed by every other type of heavy weapon. Next up is the Buzzard. It is a sidearm that handles like the Drang. It has the perk Oxmosis, which is not a nice touch. These two weapons aren't worth writing home about. There's not really much to them. The Python, on the other hand, is the best ritual weapon this season, if not overall. The inclusion of the perk Overflow means you almost never have to reload, and one-two punch seals the deal. This is the go-to weapon on my Hunter now. There are still a few downsides to the Season of Dawn. The Crucible meta is pretty stale, and skill-based matchmaking is unrefined. Most matches now boil down to which team can utilize more cheap one-shot kills. I am no Crucible expert. I am not going to break down all of the problems here. Plenty of other channels have already done so. I will say, with the strong potential for Trials of Osiris to return soon, that I am hopeful that the focus will be on fixing some of the problems in the Crucible. The Strike playlist and Heroic Story missions are there, but offer nothing exciting. Gambit is suffering in the same way the Crucible is. I expect changes, or at least some tuning, to come to the latter two ritual activities over time, but changes to the Crucible to come more readily. Despite its shortcomings, I enjoyed Shadowkeep, Season of the Undying, and the Season of Dawn. I was left wanting more in a few places, but was pleasantly surprised in others. I did not talk about the Pit of Heresy or the Class Exotics, because they do not really change the game. They aren't bad, but they aren't really worth talking about outside of the lore. This new way, Bungie is working with its storytelling and seasons will hopefully work out as the year goes on. If Season of Dawn is any indication, they seem to be honing in on the ideal way of running seasonal content. Thank you for tuning in. This has been Jarl Trigvi with Banner Broadcasting, signing off.